ओं भद्रम कर्णे शुणियाम देवा भद्रम पश्येम अक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवांसस्तनु व्यशेम देवहित यदायु स्वस्ति इंद्रो वृद्रश्रवा स्वस्ति पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 यो अंत प्रवेश मम वाच इमा प्रशुप्ता संजीवयति अखिलशक्तिर स्वदाशस्तचरणश्रवणत्वगादी प्राणानमो भगवते पुषा तोभ्यं लसत श्रीमदानंदतीर्थेन्दुर्णो हृदंबरे यद्वचंद्रिका स्वांतसतापम विनी पदवाक्य प्रमाण ज्ञा प्रणम्य शिसा गुरून व्याक्ये यथाभूत विष्णु तत्व विनिर्णय सो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग टू फ्रेंड्स जॉइनिंग फॉर द थर्ड सेशन ऑफ आथर वन उपनिषद विच एज यू ऑल नो इज ऑल्सो कॉल मुंडका उपनिषद इज वन ऑफ द थ्री वन ऑफ द वन अमंग द थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट उपनिषद ऑफ दी अथर्व वेद सो लास्ट वीक we looked at the meaning of the shanti mantra of uh, this upanishad we spent about 30 40 minutes thinking about it where our uh, summary from that is the first line this shanti mantra has got two lines right the first mantra essentially says may we hear only good things may we see only good things may our bodies and our hands and legs always celebrate in great glory and joy the glories of paramatma and may as long as we are alive in this on this earth as long as we have this sadhana sharira may we only do actions that actually please paramatma so it's a beautiful play, prayer and then we said that paramatma in his vyuha forms is celebrated in the second mantra the indra des pradyumna yeah pushan der is aniruddha okay the uh, tarksya there is sankarshana yeah and bruhaspati there is vasudeva who actually control us in moksha sthiti so we worshiped uh, we kind of dug deep into this mantra and this should be our worship every day is worship and our or uh, you know my uh, um, uh, my humble submission is let's memorize these mantras of various vedas because they kind of summarize the whole essence of that particular upanishad and once we memorize when we are walking down going for a walk or wherever we can kind of recite these mantras because they are beautiful in their own way so we did this mantra last week and then we moved to the substance matter the, the main substance of the upanishads and as you know uh, there are six khandas in this upanishad two uh, six khandas and we were in the prathama khanda prathama mundako prathama khanda and the very first class we looked at all the rishis of this upanishad very well was worth our time revising this so what did we say om brahma devanam prathama sambhuva vishvasya karta bhuvanasya gopta sa brahma vidyam sarva vidya pratishtam atharvaya jeshta putraya praha so chaturmukha brahma learned it with from paramatma and then chaturmukha passed it on to his first eldest son atharva atharvane yam pravadeta brahma atharva tam puro vacha angire brahma vidyam so atharva then passed it on to angira angira then passed it on to sa bharadvaja satyavaha praha so angira then passed on this knowledge to satyavaha bharadvajo bharadvaja means son of bharadvaja rishi bharadvaja rishi that is satyavaha angirase paravaram so this satyavaha then passed this on passed down this knowledge to angirasa okay what knowledge did he pass he passed there is a hint there that this knowledge that satyavaha handed over to angirasa is called para and avaram para means higher knowledge avara means avara apara that means lower knowledge okay so then what happened this guy this famous rishi who was there in the vedic time shaunako havai mahashalaha angirasam vidivat upasannah papracha so shaunaka who is a great 
Mahashalaha. Shalaha we understood as it could be Yedne Shala, it could be Pata Shala. So this was a guy who was a chancellor of a university in Naimisharanya that at some point had 10,000 students studying the Vedas. He was also the guy who was the first person to have ensured that 18 Puranas composed by Veda Vyasa was actually studied in detail in Naimisharanya. Okay. He himself has done a lot of great philosophical works, particularly commentaries and vidanas on Rig Veda. So Saunaka is a very exalted soul himself. And besides being a chancellor of the university, he was very well known as a Mahashalaha in the sense that he was a conductor of great sacrifices, great yajnas. Okay. And uh, we are told that in the Vedic times, that these yajnas would be huge, yeah, having hundreds and thousands of people attending. So you got to provide catering facilities, accommodation facilities and everything else. So he had all this infrastructure with him and he was a, quite a wealthy folk. He's, he comes from a wealthy folk. He had the resources to be able to do this. So despite being a very, very great saint himself, Rishi himself, Shaunako Hawaii Mahashalaha, Angirasam, so he approached this Rishi Angirasa, Vidivat, whatever the Vidis in Vedas were in the Vedic times, when you approach a Rishi, the Vidhi there is, when you request the, a, a teacher to teach you something, you don't go with a check or you don't go with a rice or you don't go with money. What you go with is Samidhi or the sticks to the Rishi. So in a very respectful way, he takes the Samidhi to the Rishi. Upasannaha, vidivate upasannaha, went close to the Rishi, Papracha, he asked him a question. Okay. So what was that question? Kasminnu bhagavo vignate sarvamidam vignatam bhavati. So that was the question that he asked. Okay. So in the next slide, we'll see what the question, we, it's important to kind of, Revise that question because once we revise that question, then we can really get the grasp of what the answer from this great Rishi was. Okay, so Kasminno Bhagavo Vignate Sarvamidam Vignatam Bhavati. Angirasa immediately put this sentence, the fourth verse Tasmai Sahovacha Dvevidye Veditavye Itihasmayate Brahma Vido Vadanti Paracha Yeva Aparacha. Rig Vedo, Yadur Vedaha, Sama Vedo, Atarva Vedaha, Siksha, Kalpo, Vyakaranam, Niruptam, Chando, Jyotishamiti, Ata Apara, Tatra Apara, Rig Vedo, Yajur Vedaha, Sama Vedo, Atarva Vedaha, Siksha, Kalpo, Vyakaranam, Niruptam, Chando, Jyotishamiti, Ata Para, Yaya, Tad Aksharam, Adigamyati. So this is a profound statement from Angirasa, not to be underestimated, because this requires a whole-scale discussion of what philosophy is, what knowledge is, and so on and so forth. These are these are basic, basic concepts. Okay. So what was the first line here? Saunako Hawaii. So Kasminnu Bhagavo Vignate Sarvamidam Vignatam Bhavati. So Angirasa. So Shaunaka approached Angirasa humbly and asked him a very important question. What was that question? Revered sir, by knowing what, the knowledge of all that I know now will be meaningful and purposeful. Because as I told you, Shaunaka was a great rishi himself. He wrote a lot of stuff. He does a lot of yajnas. He, he conducts puranas. All those things he does. He was very well versed in the yajna shastras. He was very well versed in the rituals of sacrifice and so on. So, But he's asking, I, I know so much and I do so much. But by knowing what, the knowledge of all that I know now will be meaningful and purposeful, i.e. the knowledge, when I know, when I have this knowledge, then it means that I have known all knowledge. Okay. Shaunaka had the knowledge of sacrifice and deities, but that is not sufficient for liberation, right? And those people who think that they just park their car and go to the temple and put something in, in the hundi and come back as a, as a sacrifice, they, if they feel that they'll get liberation, sadly, they are mistaken. They are not going to get liberation. When we go to our big Hindu temples and we go to various deities and worship them, just worshipping those deities, is that going to give us liberation? We might feel good about it, but it will not give us the liberation. 
because there is only one chap who can actually give liberation. Okay, but he, of course, Shaunaka had a good knowledge of all this, but he wanted to know about that supreme knowledge that will lead to liberation. So that's where the philosophical inquiry in Sanatana Dharma is. Yeah, is how am I going to reach the highest state of existence, which is liberation? So that is the question. What is that knowledge that will actually lead me to liberation? It is for that Angirasa gives this very famous verse. This is a very famous sentence of the Upanishad. Yeah. Tasmai saho vacha dve vidye vedita vye iti hasmayate brahma vido vadanti. So the knowers of Brahman declare that there are two kinds of knowledge to be had. Okay. There are only two kinds of knowledge in the whole of universe. What are those two kinds of knowledge? Parachaiva aparacha. So we have to, we broke it open last time to understand what is it that Angir is actually talking about. So remember, you have to split it open. Paracha, aparacha, and in between is the eva. So paracha, eva, aparacha becomes parachaiva aparacha. So the eva is very, very important in this lay, in this line. That needs to be very, very carefully understood. So what that Eva means is the same sacred scripture. So this is interesting. The same sacred scripture can give you para knowledge, use higher knowledge. But it can also give you apara. It also gives you the lower knowledge. It is not that there are two separate books or knowledge that is available, that one gives the knowledge of, uh, one gives the higher knowledge and the other gives the lower knowledge. No, it is the same text that can actually give you the knowledge of both. Okay? We will come to that in, in the next part. The, the rest of this session will basically be focused on how is it possible that one scripture can give us the knowledge of both. Yeah. So that is what I plan to do for the rest of the class. But here, there's moving on here. So our uh, Angirasa said, first he gave what is apara knowledge? What is lower knowledge? And he said, my dear Shaunaka, you can get lower knowledge. What is no lower knowledge? We need to understand first. First, before we go to higher knowledge, we need to understand what is lower knowledge. Okay? Lower knowledge is not bad knowledge. Lower knowledge is not ignorance. Okay, Lower knowledge there are only three types of lower knowledge. Material science, science of all the rituals, and the knowledge of the deities that the Vedas can give us. So these are the three aparavidyas. So this we need to get it into our head. Whatever we are doing in our daily life, whatever careers that we may be having, whatever daily mundane activities that we do, etc., they all fall in this, this, this umbrella called the material science okay and then so there are all the efforts to know the universe the science the stem special the stem subjects they all fall under this material science okay so then you have the science of the sacrifice science of the sacrifices how do you do various yajnas but that yajnas can actually be extrapolated a bit more yeah this this the yajna of a surgery if i do a surgery that is also a yajna Okay, so there are so many things that we can do that actually becomes a yajna. If you're doing a surgery, if you're doing, a, if you're a big IT wizard, the, the job that you do is also a yajna. But if you do that yajna in the material plane, that also becomes an aparavidya. And then the knowledge of the deities that I alluded to very briefly, that you go to a temple and you worship the various deities, the spirit in which you worship the deities should be as per the Shanti Mantra of this Upanishad. Okay but not as bestowers of liberation. So that's the Upanishads are very clear about that. So material science, science of sacrifice, and the knowledge of the deities. So they three together form the Aparavidya. Okay? So you can get the knowledge of all this, the material science, the science of sacrifice, and the knowledge through Rig Vedo, Yajur Vedaha, Sama Vedo, Atarva Vedaha, Siksha, Kalpo, Vyakaranam, Niruktam, Chando, Jyoti, Shamiti. So basically, in these two lines, Angirasa has summarized the whole of the Vedic lore, which is the, of course, the Vedas are, as we know, is, is, is infinite. But Vyasa summarized it for us, isn't it, into various branches, Rikyaju, Sama, Atarva. 
then of course each one has samhita brahmana aranyaka and upanishads then you have the vedangas shiksha phonetics kalpa text of rituals vyakarana grammar niruktam etymology chandaha meter jyotisham astronomy okay so all these vedangas and the vedas is listed by angirasa and say that all these my dear shaunaka can actually give you lower knowledge which can be material science science of the sacrifice or the knowledge of the deities okay so we had a now we understand what aparavidya is but it's all well and good in this line to actually say what aparavidya is but can we actually look at it with some illustrations which is what we did um last week we kind of left at this point we said look vedas and the vedangas and all these all these scriptures that is available in the sanatana dharma can be approached for us to know about material science okay so go to vedicheritage.gov.in forward slash science and it gives you a list of all the you know subjects that are there in the vedas agriculture astronomy cosmology mathematics science medicine legal system metallurgy philology environmental sciences all the things that that we are doing now many of us will be practicing something of this okay in our professions so ideas and knowledge of this is available in the vedas with whatever veda that is left at this point we know most of the vedas have been lost but whatever veda that is left at this point of time we can have all the knowledge of this material science yeah so here you have an evidence to show that vedas when you read the vedas they can give you meti knowledge of the material science and when you perceive when you when you take that view that i can only get material the knowledge of material science from the vedas then it becomes aparavidya okay but we will see in the subsequent uh, you know slides that the same lines and words of the vedas can actually become paravidya okay now here is the next one the signs of the sacrifice okay how can the sign the signs of sacrifice that is you know how, how how many bricks do you need how much do you dig how many woods you need what mantras you are going to say where are you going to sit how many people are be there what mantras do i recite why do i recite this mantra they all become the signs of the sacrifice or the signs of yagna okay yagna usually has an yajamana and yajamani and they do things for various material benefits okay so if you just look at the vedas just as the signs of sacrifice it just tells you about the rituals do this do that and so on some people are stuck at that level yeah some people stuck are stuck at that level and krishna has categorically censured those people who are stuck just at the sacrificial level we need to go higher than that that is what this upanishad says and that's what krishna also says in the gita so what i've done is yajurveda for example so we know that yajurveda is the is considered okay it some people view yajurveda as that body of text that talks about the signs of the sacrifice how do you do yagnas okay so what i want to do is i just want to play the first verse of the yajurveda the samhita portion of the yajurveda i just want to play the first verse and i hope the video the audio comes across uh, okay yeah so i'm just going to play this just for 2 minutes 3 minutes let's listen to the first mantra of the yajurveda the veda of yajana and see how it sounds like ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠತಮಾ ಕರ್ಮಣ ಆಪ್ಯಾಯಧ್ವಮಗ್ಯಾಗಮೂರ್ಜಸ್ವತಿ ಪಯಸ್ವತಿ ಪ್ರಜಾವತಿ ರನಮೇವ 
ಅಯಕ್ಷ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ನೀಷತಮಘಸಗುಂಸೋರುದ್ರೇತಿ ಪರಿವೃಣಕ್ತುಧ್ರುವ ಅಸ್ಮಿನ್ಗೋಪತ ಸ್ಯಾತ್ಯಜಮಸ ಪಶೋನ್ ಪಾಹಿ so i hope that audio that audio came out all right okay the very first mantra of ayurveda so our teachers uh, you know talk to us a lot about these kind of you know very cryptic verses of ayurveda and how to understand it from a from a higher sense okay but what i'm trying to do here is i'm going to give you how that science of sacrifice happens in the vedic times these are all the rules that are said ishetva urjetva so one view there is in the vedic times cows were the were the source of everything right they were also the source of wealth and property and also of sustenance so early in the morning what do you do you take a stick and then you take the cows to graze in the field you separate the cows and the calves using a stick so when that stick is done this fellow will actually say this mantra ishetva urjetva and he, and he will go around okay so that is how the sacrifice is done for every action that was committed in the vedic times there will be a mantra okay so now without going into the great details of this so ishetva isha means food or vigor so the idea there is for our food we are going to send this cattle to graze and the cows give milk and from milk we make curds and from curds we make butter and the butter gives us the energy so that is called urje urja okay so we are going to graze this cattle so that is it looks in a very superficial sense that this mantra is telling us how to graze a cattle in the vedic times okay so the mantra in a very you know this is in again in a very superficial sense we invoke you o lord for food we invoke you for vigor okay um, you are the vital breath may the creator lord depute you o sacrificer to the noblest accomplishments o cow may you flourish with the blessings of the resplendent raw lord may you be free from disease and consumption and bear good progeny may no thief nor a slaughter be in possession of you may you permanently multiply in large numbers in the house of the master of the cattle o oh lord preserve the cattle of the sacrifice okay so it looks like a beautiful prayer like uh, uh, basically the 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 yajamana is saying i got a lot of cattle please protect me preserve me because i want food and energy and sustenance and so on it's a beautiful mantra but believe me it's in a different plane when you look at it from a paravidya aspect of it and i'll come to that in the later part i'll use the same slide and illustrate how it becomes a paravidya okay o oh lord protect the cattle of the sacrifice yajamanasya pashun pahi okay, look at yajna yajna yagnya yagnya comes from the root yaj yaj means what dana deva puja and sangati karana so those are the three meanings of yagnya there are no other meanings yagnya is only three dana deva puja sangati karana krishna talks about this in in various chapters what is ja- dana charity and benevolent help what is deva puja reverence to the men of knowledge harnessing the nature for social good keeping an environment free of pollution they are all deva pujas sangati karana establishing benevolent institutions open schools colleges universities hospitals etc developing industries for human good developing science and technology they are all grouped under sangati karana okay. so shreshta tamaya karmana supreme duty done for general good without any expectations of reward or return performed without att- attachment all these at material plane becomes aparavidya okay so the whole the, the transactions of life that we do that of course krishna talks about karma yoga they right and that whole activities that we do can come under yajna or yajana okay dana deva puja and sangati karana when done on a material plane okay so at that point it becomes an aparavidya that is what angirasa is saying 
Yeah, when he says, Parachaiva Aparacha. Okay, and now he is talking about this Apara. How does this Veda gives you the knowledge of the, gives you information about the lower knowledge. Okay, so here I've got a brief quiz. We got these six darshanas of Indian philosophy, right? And there is the Purva Mimamsa. So who is going to tell us what Purva Mimamsa is and who is the Rishi who actually brought this forward? So who is going to tell us what is Purva Mimamsa and who is the Rishi? Uh, Prakash, you go for it. Uh, okay, I forgot the Rishi, I, uh, but uh, Mimamsa stands for rituals, only rituals. That is to do only uh, actions. So, Kuru, Kuru, do this, do this, Mimamsa. But I forgot the Rishi, I, you told me I forgot it. No so problem. The, I think the Rishi is a Kumari Labata. Uh, uh, okay, Kumari Labata. Thank you, Srinivasanji. Uh, uh, even before Kumari Labata. Um, uh, Jamini. 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 Yeah, correct. Yes, thank you. So, you got Jaimini as the Rishi who who brings forth and propagates Purva Mimamsa for rituals. But what has happened down the generations is everybody has thought Jaimini is just doing, asking us to do superficial rituals. But there are higher philosophies. Jaimini at the end of the day was Badarayana student, right? But we all got it, right? Fantastic. So, Purva Mimamsa is that school of philosophy that talks about rituals and for them sacrifice is the be all and end all of everything there is nothing called liberation and and so on you just do this sacrifice you get this benefit and you live happily okay so that is purva mimamsa which specializes in only this sacrifice okay but of course angirasa is telling us asking us to go to a higher plane so we will see what that higher plane will be Okay, so I hope you found that interesting as to how yajana, that is the, all the activities that we are currently doing in our professional and personal lives can all be equated as yajna of some type. All that we need to reflect is, is this yajna at a lower level or at a higher level? Currently, I think 99% of what we do is at a lower level. So that remains a aparavidya. Okay. So let me. Uh, uh, so now the next question is the knowledge of the deities. Okay, the Vedic pantheon, the knowledge of the Vedic pantheon is important to understand the language of the Vedas. That we all agree. But according to Angirasa, even the knowledge of the deities is a lower vidya. It is an upper vidya because the no the deities cannot take us to liberation themselves. If we just think that the deities can take us to liberation, then that becomes aparavidya. But if you take deities as somebody who can be our gurus and take us towards Paramatma, then that becomes paravidya. Okay. So we, this morning we were doing some classes and, and incidentally this came about. So in Shatapata Brahmanam, for example, you have Mruda Bravid. Apaho Abruvan, Chandogya Punisha, Ta Apa Aikshanta, Ta Tejo Aikshanta. So the mud spoke, the water spoke, the water saw, the, the, the fire saw. How can these non material things see or talk or do anything? So they don't make sense. In Antaryami Brahmanam, for example, of Brahadarani Upanishad, you have all these beautiful mantras over 21 mantras that talk about Prithivyam, Trishtan. Prithivya antaro yam prithivi na veda yasya prithivi shariram ya prithivim antaro yamayati yeshata atma antaryami amrutaha. It's a very famous mantra. We have done this so many times in our classes. So prithivi, apsu, agni, antarikshe, vayau. So all these names are there. They all talk about material things, right? Earth, water, fire, sky, wind. So if you look at them as non-material jadas, they make no sense. Okay, but to understand these things, our our guru Veda Vyasa did a did a sutra, right? We all know this. Abhimani vyapadeshastu visesha anugati vyam. So wherever in the in the Vedas you have these kind of jadas that come in, these kind of no, material things that come in, you should always see behind this material entity there is a sentient being. Okay, so that is one rule that we know. Okay. But if we just stop at that level, then again, that becomes aparavidya. 
take Katha Upanishad, for example, uh, very famous verse. We have done this, you know, Katha Upanishad, as you know. Indrebya parahi artha artebya shta param manaha. Manasastu para buddher buddher atma mahan paraha. Mahataha param avyaktam avyakta purusha paraha purushan na param kinchit sakashta saparagatihi. So that takes you to a slightly higher level, but then you have all this Indriya, Artha, and also what are these things? Abhimani Vyapadeshastu Visesha Nagati Bhyan. Okay, so Badarayana asks us to think about all these sentient Indriya Abhimani Devatas in the chariot. Okay, remember the chariot. In fact, Shakalya Brahmanam Abrahadar and Ekupanishad, it talks about all these deities. Ashto, Vasavaha, Ekadasha, Rudraha, Dvadasha, Adityaste, Ekatrimshat, Indriyashtya, Prajapatishtya, Trayamshit, Shaviti. So it even lists, the Vedas will list all the deities that are out there. It gives into various details about this. So you can do your your research and look for all these deities that are described, Indra, Varuna, Mitra, etc., etc. Okay. And of course, Veda Vyasa has given us rules as to how to look at this. He has also given other rules as to how you go to the higher level. That is, the, those slides are coming up next. But if we stop at this level, if we just think about just the deities and, and not the Deva, then it becomes Aparavidya. So this is very, very important for us. The reason why uh, I thought we should spend a lot of time understanding this para and apara is so that we have this, you know, stuck in our head when we go to temples or do anything that we do to always see, am I doing apara or is this, this para? Is it apara? Is it para? Is it shreyas? Is this prayas? So keep on thinking about this. Then maybe our activities will become more interesting. So to summarize what Apara is only three aspects. The all of material science, which is what all of us do. The science of the sacrifice and the knowledge of the deities. So all these three become, are Aparavidyas. Where can you get this Aparavidya? You can come get it all these from the Vedas and the Vedangas and all the other ancillary texts that supports the scriptures. The, the you know, Of course, Rigadya, Bharatam, Chaiva. Pancharatra Mata Akalam Mularama Yenam Chaiva Puranam Chayetad Atmakam Yeche Anuyayina Stesham Sarvete Sadagam. That's the definition, right? So all these huge volume of scriptures that we have, they all become apara. If you see, it's all from your perspective, your interpretation. How do you interpret the scriptures? If you interpret them as giving you only these three knowledges, they are Aparavidya Shaunaka is the declaration of Angirasa. So then he gives us the one that we are after. Yeah, so we are interested in Paravidya, right? In our satsang and everywhere else. Ata para yaya tad aksharam adigamya. Okay. When understood as a source of knowledge of akshara then this same scripture or scriptures become Paravidya. So that is the beauty of what Angirasa is telling us. Okay, so all these Vedas and Vedangas will remain Apara as long as we don't bring Akshara into this equation. Okay? As soon as we know how to read and interpret the Vedas properly, we will realize that the whole of the Vedas only talk about this Akshara. And when we understand that that is what is going on in the Vedas, that the whole Ananta Vai Veda is only talking about Akshara. And when we interpret the Vedas like that, then they become Paravidya. Okay? So this is a fundamental definition of Sanatana Dharma with regards to Veda. So I mean, what is Sanatana Dharma? Sat, Nadana, Dharma. Nada means what sound? Eternal sounds. What are the eternal sounds? Vedas are the eternal sounds. What do the Vedas give? They give knowledge of dharmas. What dharma? Not just the Purushartha. The supreme dharma is supreme lord. That is, in fact, Vishnu Sahasranama says dharma is the name of Vishnu. So that defectless, sat there means nirdosha, defectless Vedas that give us the knowledge of Paramatma is Sanatana Dharma. Okay? And that is what uh, Angiresai is leading us to. Prakashji. Very quick question. The Vedas 
are they infinite in the number of mantras or they are infinite number of in, in the in terms of meaning which is which is right uh, sorry prakash i didn't get the last sentence did you say infinite with yeah. regards to the meanings the, for example is it only for example when you listed out the number of mantras which are available today is it the 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 in terms of mantras is it infinite in number or is it in terms of uh, mantras it is finite but in terms of meanings you can uh, you know uh, enumerate a lot of meanings from those uh, set number of mantras which yes. is infinite yeah. when we say vedas are an ananto hai hi veda which, what what is the right thing yeah beautiful question uh, prakash ji uh, so i will i just open it up so does this folks have a view on this one so what prakash ji is asking is are the vedas with regards to the text the words and the sentences and so on are they infinite or the each word and sentences will have infinite meaning so how do we understand this anybody wants to come here and contribute please so prakash ji uh, my understanding from the gurus that i have yeah. learned is it's both sorry shrinivas ji go for okay actually the veda in them so declare ananta vai veda so that means uh, you know it is uh, uh, countless but then what we have today present as you said in your in that in the last lectures right there are only like a finite of them so what is existing today is finite but what we have lost and many more is based according to veda itself is uh, infinite so they must be infinite Thank and you. of course there are many meanings to the vedas too right i mean there is like acharya had said there is like a 10 me you know even for vishnu sahasranama right there are like a 10 meanings of for each even 100 meanings or something like that for each uh, name right so similarly on the vedas also there could be many many meanings i don't know whether it could be infinite but many meanings are possible beautiful uh, shrinivasindi thank you very much so yeah mataji uh, yeah. is it that veda is knowledge is it that knowledge is infinite because when uh, uh, chaturmukha brahma was given a uh, god tells him to create he try to read vedas and they say he couldn't read i mean couldn't understand so he did the matana for thousands of years and uh, then uh, then he heard the voice and then he could do because god told him to do tapas and uh, he did it but uh, the knowledge is said to be infinite i thought it's not the mantras or i don't know that's what my understanding is i have not uh, studied yeah. much but uh, thank you shila ji so all very interesting ideas that are coming out so i think uh, the, the core answer there is yes of course i mean as srinivas ji is mentioned when the vedas them, themselves tell us ananta vai veda means that there must be infinite infinite sounds and uh, infinite uh, words and sounds after all what is a word it's made of letters what is a letter letter is symbolic of a sound right so these infinite sounds that are out there in infinite combinations yeah this varanas which are all pervasive and eternal and they are in eternal sequences and those eternal sequences are infinite in numbers and in tatva nirnaya acharya talks about this in paricheda 1 It uh, talks about this varana and how they are infinite. So, from that perspective, ananta vai veda, vedas they they are infinite, and the meanings again, uh, again the the traditional rendering is vedas have at least three meanings. Gita has at least ten meanings. Vishnu Sahasranama, each word of Vishnu has got at least ten meanings. It's only got at least. Yeah, we don't even know one, but it's got at least three. but depending on the capacity so for example if it is mukya prana or chaturmukha brahma the way they understand every sound and the word as celebrating the paramatma will be so different from us so to me it feels like it is both infinite in infinite to the power infinite is because paramatma's gunas is infinite to the infinite right so it is not only infinite gunas that he has each guna is of infinite degree yeah so infinite time infinite as it is celebrated that is why it's called purna so it feels like there must be you know endless meanings to these words but it's only our capacity of understanding it anyway beautiful discussion thank you so much for that so what did angirasa say ata para yaya tad aksharam adigamyate so when we know the when we get the knowledge of akshara then this veda becomes paravidya or highest knowledge Yeah. akshara 
is a very interesting word. Who or what is Akshara? So I've just opened it up so that we have a background so that we all think about who this Akshara or what is this Akshara is of the Vedas. Then I go to the next slides to, to give you a, an overview of what, what our Acharyas have told us about Akshara. Anybody wants to come in and tell us what is Akshara or what is their understand of Akshara, understanding of Akshara is? What I have understood by you is Akshara is Kutastha Akshara, Mahalakshmi. I don't know. Shilaji, uh, thank you, Shilaji. Kutastha Akshara of chapter 15. Yeah, so we'll come to that in the next slide. Srinivasanji? It is both. It is Lakshmi and then Mukhyataha Narayana. Excellent. Okay, brilliant. So we got some of the answers already. So let's think about Akshara of the Upanishad. Okay, this word Akshara is not a. Angirasa has not put this word just in random. It, it's got a profound reason why Angirasa has actually described this. The knowledge of this being as this being as akshara. Okay. So if Atharvana, of course, is Tad Akshara Madhigamyate. Look at Mandukya Upanishad. Harihi Om. Om iti etad aksharang idang sarvam tasya upavyakyanam. Chandogya Upanishad. This is the first verse of Mandukya. Look at the Chandogya Upanishad, very first verse. Om iti etad aksharam udgidam upasita. Look at Gita 8.3. Who wants to recite Gita 8.3? It's a beautiful man, uh, verse. Um, our Anand, go for it. Aksharam Brahma Paramam Swabhavo Dhyatma Uchate Bhuta Bhavo Bhavakaraha Visarga Karma Sangitaha. Thank you, Anand. Beautiful. So, Aksharam Brahma Paramam. So, Krishna is uh, saying who this Akshara is in that word in 8 3 also. So, in Gita also, you will get Aksharam. But if you want to know Akshara Brahmanam, well, believe me, there is a Brahmanam of Brihadaranya Kupanishad that actually talks only about Akshara. It's called Akshara Brahmanam. Go and check it out. It's a beautiful, beautiful section of Brihadaranya Kupanishad. In fact, Veda Vyasa has actually has done a sutra to answer to Shilaji's answer. Aksharam Ambaranta Dritehe. Okay. Sorry, we had one of our colleagues raise hands. I missed it. Who was it? Please come on, please. Somebody raised Sorry, their hand. I think yeah. that was me. Uh, yeah, okay. No, no, thanks. Okay, thanks, Anand. So, um, so there is a Akshara Brahmanam of Brahadarya Kupanishad, and Veda Vyasa has actually given us a sutra. Aksharam Ambaranta Dritehe. Okay. So, what is that? So, I just want to spend two minutes talking about this very, very beautiful story in uh, not a story, a beautiful incident in Brahadarya Kupanishad. So there is this king of Videha called Janaka. Nothing to do with Sita's um, dad. Yeah? It's a king of Videha called Janaka. So this guy, he is very much philosophically bound and he is interested in knowledge and so on. So what he does once is he invites all the, all the rishis who have knowledge of Brahman to come to come for a conference. So he, he organizes a conference and everybody comes there. But he says, and the, and the king says, whoever can demonstrate that they've got the highest knowledge of Brahman, I will give them a thousand cows and each cow in the two horns, I'll dangle a few gold coins on either side. So you not only get the cows, you also get lots times two gold coins as well. So that is the price for whoever can demonstrate that he or she has got the highest knowledge of Brahman. Okay. So all these uh, rishis, they congregate to this conference. And when the king announces this prize, yes, the, the rishis are a little bit enthusiastic, but they're also scared because they don't want to get up and say that I know everything about Brahman. And then somebody asks a question and they're embarrassed and they lose the battle. Yeah. And they lose the argument. So that is much more insulting for them. So nobody gets up. So at that point, the famous rishi of the Vedas, Yagna Valkya. Okay. So the Yagna Valkya, he asks one of his students and he says, Go and get all the cows. Let's go back to our ashrama. Collect all the cows and the gold coins from the king. Let's go back. So he gets up, instructs his students, and he starts and he instructs him to collect all the cows and the gold coins. So at that point, the other rishis who are sitting there, they take an exception and they say, look at this egoistic fellow. How can he just claim that he knows everything about Brahman and take away the cows? And there is a, a, a conversation that happens. And Yagnavalka says, look, guys, I just want cows and I'm just taking the cows with me. If you want to ask me a question and test my knowledge about Brahman, go for it. Okay? So that is how that, uh, that beautiful section, the eighth, uh, that, uh, the, the, the third adhyaya, the third part, the eighth adhyaya uh, talks about it. 
So go on. So at that point, the various rishis ask various questions. Okay, Ashvalayana and so on and so forth. They all ask various questions, and then Gargi, she gets up. Okay, so Gargi. See again, one of the things I want to point out here is. In the Vedic times, you had all sorts of people who are great rishis and rishikas. Gargi is one among them. Gargi, she is also called Vachaknavi. Okay, she gets up and she says, uh, "Rishis, I am going to ask Yagnavalkya two questions, and if he answers the two questions, then believe me, he knows everything about Brahman, and he has won the argument." So the rishi says, "Okay, go ahead and ask this question." And then that is how the, that Upanishad starts. So that is called Akshara Brahmanam that talks about this Brahman who is called Akshara. So the first question, there was an answer. Akasha eva tad otamcha protamcha. So she says, so the, I mean, we don't want to go into that. Kasminna kalu akashe otashta protashta sahovacha etad vaitad aksharam gargi brahmanaha abhivadanti. So I'm just introducing this Akshara Brahmana Brahadara Nika, where there is a conversation between Gargi and Yagnya Valkya about who this Akshara is. So, and then our Guru Veda Vyasa takes this as the Vishayavakya and then settles the argument Aksharamam Aksharam Ambaranta Dritehe. So what does that mean? So this is the, uh, so I've summarized this for our benefit and maybe we will have time to do this and a little bit more. So this slide basically gives you the summary of who this Akshara is. Okay. So when you look at words, any word, there are two ways of looking at, right? So there is the conventional way of looking at what is the conventional meaning of the word? What is the etymological meaning of the word? And of course, in our forums, we spend a lot of time talking about etymological things, etymological sense of the word. So that's breaking it open and see what it means. But conventional is also very important. Rudi, as it's called, Rudi, and this is Yogika. So conventional is Rudi Artha. So the Rudi Artha or the conventional meanings of Akshara, okay, there are four. One is syllable. Akshara means a letter, syllable. Look at Om. Om is a syllable. How is the Om celebrated as? Bija Akshara Mantra. Okay, so there is an inner meaning of why it is called Bija Akshara Mantra. Anybody wants to come in and tell us why Om is called Bija Akshara Mantra? Yeah, Pragnesh. We covered it recently. I know we have done a lot. I think three months you took 12 classes on home. But the recent knowledge I can uh, regurgitate is it is Bur, Boa, Swaha, which is past, present and future. Or uh, Rigveda, Yajurveda and Samveda, which is Akara, Ukara and Makara. Akara is spoken with the mouth, uh, with the lips wide open. Ukara with the purse together. And Makara when they touch each other. Thank you. Thank you, Pragnesh. Yeah, yeah. So that's beautiful, beautiful. So uh, it, it, Bija, this syllable Om expands. It expands into so many things and all the sounds of the universe. It is uh, Akara, Ukara, Makara. It is Vyahriti. And it is uh, Gayatri. It is Purusha Shukta. It is Rigaju Sama. And it is all the sounds of the universe, which is what we have done. So in that sense, it says Bija. It is like a seed. If you plant the seed, it not only grows into, it sprouts into a plant, into a shrub, into this gigantic tree. So that is one meaning of Bija Akshara Mantra. But that Akshara there has got deeper understandings of what that Akshara is. So I just want to introduce that idea and we will be seeing it in the rest of the slides. Mula Prakriti is also called Akshara. Okay, That is the primordial matter. So what is the meaning of Akshara? So Akshara in a very rudy sense, in a very conventional sense, it's Naksharati, imperishable. Okay? Akshara means imperishable. Okay, so you look at the beauty of our Vedic Rishis and the signs that they are talking about here. I was quite uh, you know, astounded when I, when, I, when I read this. So Akshara, Mula Prakriti or primordial matter is also called Akshara. Okay. Why is the primordial matter called Akshara? So think about this point of singularity right before the Big Bang. That point of singularity that has whatever that is with infinite gravity, it is never destroyed. It just 
expands and becomes the universe and then again it goes back to that usual state. That Mula Prakriti state is eternal. It's Anadi Nitya. It is never destroyed. That Mula Prakriti. Yeah. So that is why Mula Prakriti is called Akshara. Now we all know from the Vedic pantheon studies, the Abhimani Devata of Mula Prakriti is Chetana Prakriti or Lakshmi. So in a conventional sense, Lakshmi is also called Akshara. And there are many people who, who name their daughters as Akshara. You might have noticed it is on this ground that Lakshmi is also called Akshara. Then, of course, the supreme Akshara is Vishnu himself, who is, of course, Anadi Nitya, independently Anadi Nitya. All others are dependently Anadi Nitya. Okay? So, Vishnu is also called Akshara. Okay. Yaya tad aksharam adhigamyate. There we have to understand. First we need to understand what are all the various meanings of akshara and then decide what is it that Angirasa is talking about. Okay. So conventional sense, four meanings. Akshara as syllables, Mula Prakriti, Chetana Prakriti or Vishnu. Okay. But we should also look at akshara from an etymological sense. Okay. Etymologically, Akshara, the etymology of Akshara is Ashnute iti Aksharam. So that which is all pervasive and omnipresent is called Aksharam. Okay. So that is one etymological sense of Akshara, which is also profoundly scientific. If you think the Mula Prakriti, this primordial matter is Akshara, then think about this idea. Where is this Mula Prakriti? This Mula Prakriti has to be in space. Okay. It is not the space of the Panchabhuta, which is a further evolution in the creation of the universe, where you had Bhuta, where you had Akasha, Vayu, uh, and all that, right? Um, so that is a Panchabhuta. Don't confuse with that space. The question that the Rishis are asking here is for the Mula Prakriti to be there, it has to be there in some space. Okay. So that space is called Avyakrita Akasha. That all pervasive, omnipresent space is called Avyakrita Akasha. This is what here Veda Vyasa talks about. Ambara Antadritehe. Ambara means the sky, the space. Yeah. So Avyakrita Akasha. So Ashnute iti Aksharam means Avyakrita Akasha, not the material sky, which is a Bhuta Akasha, which is a later evolute. Pre creation Mula Prakriti exists in this space. Yeah. In fact, the whole, this is the view of the Rishis, which is amazing. The whole of the material space is under an, under this ever-present space called Avyakrita Akasha. The philosophers actually classify space into two, Bhuta Akasha and Avyakrita Akasha. So the Avyakrita Akasha is called Akshara. Ashnuteti Aksharam. Here is another beautiful thing. Lakshmi or Sri Tattva is also all-pervasive. Okay. That is her characteristic. She is all pervasive. Samanacha. So she is called Samana in Brahma Sutra. In Veda Vyasa celebrates Lakshmi as Samana because like Vishnu, she is also all pervasive. Yeah. So in that sense, Lakshmi is also called Ashnute Yiti Aksharam. Then of course, our Vishnu is Aksharamam Ambaranta Dhritehe. He is the one that controls everything. Okay? So he is all pervasive, supreme Akshara. So he is the Ashnute Iti Aksharam in all aspects. Time, place and Guna. Right? That's why he is called Brahman. Right? Atakasmat Uchate Brahmeti Bruhantohi Asmin Gunaha. He pervades in all the three. Time, space and Gunas. Lakshmi only in time and space. Okay? Gunas Dependent gunas, Vishnu, independent gunas, eternal, infinite, times infinite to the power infinite gunas. So in that sense, Vishnu becomes, when you talk about Ashnute iti Aksharam, it is Vishnu. Now, another way of looking at Akshara, A plus Kshara. Okay? So A plus Kshara, Kshara means that which is getting destroyed, that which falls down, that which is destroyed is called Kshara. And in Gita Tatparya, Acharya gives a definition of who the Kshara says. Anityatvam, Deha Hanihi. 
துக்க பிராப்தீர் அபூர்ணதா நாச சதுர்விதக புரோக்தகா தத் அபாவோ ஹரேஹே சதா பியூட்டிஃபுல் வேர்ஸ் தட் கிவ்ஸ் அ டெஃபினேஷன் ஆஃப் ஹூ த க்ஷரா இஸ் அனித்யத்வம் டெம்பரரி எக்ஸிஸ்டன்ஸ் தேக ஹானி த பாடி ஃபால்ஸ் டவுன் சோ தே ஆர் கால்ட் க்ஷராஸ் துக்க பிராப்தி தே ஆர் ப்ரோன் ஃபார் சஃபரிங் க்ஷராஸ் அபூர்ணதா தே ஆர் நாட் full in all the three aspects time space and gunas okay so those are the four ways in which kshara's are defined hari is beyond all this that's the definition of kshara's so akshara means that which does not have any of these four of course vishnu does not have this and the liberated souls also do not have this but the liberated souls have had a kshara body before they become liberated so they are not primarily akshara's then you have of course lakshmi who is also akshara because she is always liberated she is never she is never in samsara lakshmi like vishnu yeah so those are all the beauties of the word akshara that actually opens up the whole philosophy of vedas now you have this aksha plus ra the same akshara is opened as aksha plus ra aksha means what indriyas in fact the shanti mantra is what bhadram karane bihi shruniyam devah பத்ரம் பசியேம அக்ஷபிஹிஜத்ராஹாஜன்ரலிஸ்ட்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்ஸ்ரோல்
So I hope I was able to illustrate how the word Akshara, it's not an ordinary word. Angirasa has put this so much because it captures the essence of the Vedas and it gives us so much of knowledge when you break it open. After all, what is Vedas? Chadayanti iti chandamsi. We have to open it and then understand and get the deeper meanings of the Vedas. And this very word Akshara basically summarizes the whole philosophy of the Vedas. Yeah. Who is going to take up 15, 16, the Gita verse? Pragnesh, go for it. Dwami vo purasho loke evacha Thank you. Thank you very much, Pragnesh. Beautiful, beautiful. So there that kutastho akshara. So that is what that is why having this knowledge of what akshara means, if we have this background, then we will be able to appreciate what is it that Krishna is talking about here. Sharaha Sarvani Bhutani. So, Kshara's, that is you and me, who have Anityatvam, Dehahani, Dukkha Prapti, Apurnata, there are infinite numbers like us. We come and go in various creations. There are infinite. So, Kshara Sarvani Bhutani. Whereas, so this is in plural. Whereas, Kutastaha Akshara Uchyate. There is only one Kutastho Aksharaha. Kutastaha. So, there, um, Shilaji, just for reminder, if you go back to the class in Gita that we did, Kutastaha, the etymology there is two types. Kutam stapayati and kutastaha. Kuta means sky. Sky doesn't stick to anything. So the idea there is, there is this entity which is all pervasive, which is never in, which is never linked with material world. So that is Lakshmi, kutastaha from the akshara that we have read. And she is also kutam stapayati. So she brings all these uh, three material things, mix up each of the Satvarajas, brings them together and she brings all these jivas into samsara, right? She links them with the material bodies. We have done all that. So this kuta, this kuta of jivas, they, she is tapayati in samsara. So kuta and kutam stapayati. That akshara that does that is kutasto akshara, which is shri tattva. And then you have the akshara. Okay, Aksharaha. When the entire Veda is understood to describe Akshara, then that becomes Paravidya. Okay, so I want to keep up to my time. So it is it's about one o'clock. So we will close at this point, but there is so much more to discuss. Next, the next class, what we will do is how on earth is that possible that the entire Vedas, every word and every sound in the Vedas. How can they only talk about this Akshara? Just now we have done the verse of the Yajur Veda, right? The very first verse of the Yajur Veda, which says, go and go and go and graze your cows, pro protect my cows, give me lots of cows. How can that become the knowledge of the Akshara? Okay. Then you have so many other words in Vedas. How can all those also become a knowledge of Akshara? So that is what Paravidya is. So to understand the language of the Vedas, the, basically what Angirasa is telling us is to understand the language of the Vedas, we need to get ourselves to a higher level of interpretation and an understanding of the Vedas. Okay, so that is where it is coming at. What is that Paravidya? Now, for example, Paravidyakam Chakre Shastram Sutram Shastram Anuttamam. So this Brahma Sutra, for example, Acharya will talk about that as a Paravidya. And this Vedas, when you, you use Brahma Sutras and interpret, that becomes Paravidya. Then what are the rules of interpretations of the Vedas? If you adopt those interpretations, then you will understand the Vedas talk about only this Akshara. Okay. So those are all the things that we. I hope we will be able to deal with in the next class because I think we need to progress very slowly and carefully and touch upon all the angles of interpretation because we need to elevate ourselves to higher levels of the interpretation of the Vedas, okay? not at a lower level. When you look at that higher level, it opens up into an entirely different aspect. The philosophy is entirely different. This is exactly other other uh, philosophies do Kabbalistic interpretation. So it's very common, it's, it's, it's available in Catholicism, in Judaism and so on, this Kabbalistic interpretation of their scriptures. And our Vedic rishis had done this technique several thousand years before that. So yeah, that is how you, that is called Tatpariya Lingas and how you understand it. So what I want to do in the next class is 
discuss those things so that we have an introduction to the beauty of interpretation of the Vedas and not sit at a very superficial level and say, this is Karma Kanda, this is Jnana Kanda, this is Tattva Vedaka, this is Atattva Vedaka. All this, I'm afraid they don't make higher sc sc scholastic interpretations. So we need to look at it from a deeper Paravidya perspective and hopefully I'll be able to impress upon you next week as to what that actually means. Okay, so with that note, I'm going to close today's session. And um, as you see, I can see I have a number of slides coming up on this most important topic. So, Anand, questions? Krishna so, Pranamast. When we, when we define Upanishads as that which provides higher knowledge, and then to define Paravidya and Aparavidya, Aparavidya, although we call it as a lower knowledge, Am I right in understanding that it is not an inferior knowledge or any lesser knowledge because we do need a paravidya to understand paravidya. So to call to call or to, to understand that the Upanishads are giving lesser knowledge may not be appropriate. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, it may not be appropriate, Anand, you're very right about this. So that's why it, it all, the Upanishads also depends upon the way you interpret it. Yeah, so you cannot, even in Upanishads, there are, there are some folks who, who will take certain lines and verses in the Upanishads that talk about only Karmakanda. And there are some folks who will talk about, say, for example, the same uh, author when Upanishad will, will say, Dvasuparana, Sayuja, Sakaya, Samana, Vriksham, Parisheshva, Jate, Thayor, Anyaha, Pippalam, Swadati, Anashnan, Anyaha, Abhichakashiti. So the same verse of these Upanishads, some folks call them as Atatva Vedaka and they are not truth declaring. Okay. So all these interpretations are out there. So it is our problem. So this is only our problem. The Upanishads is what Upanishads is part of the Vedas, right? Vedas are supreme source of authority. Why? Aparush, Apaurusheya, Nityatva and Swataha Pramanya. So those are the three criteria that define why Vedas are supreme source of knowledge. And they are Swataha Pramanya. They are always valid. Okay? It is only our interpretation. It is our problem. With what lens are we looking at it? That is what it boils down to. When some folks look, look at it through a lens which is defective, then they will say this is lower knowledge and higher knowledge. No. Srimad Acharya has categorically established that Upanishads are always higher knowledge everywhere. Every letter and sound is only higher knowledge. It's Paravidya. Provided you use the Brahma Sutras and all the Tatparya Lingas and understand it properly. So it is only our problem, Anand, that we are not understanding it. Vedas intrinsically are always talking only about Paravidya. So it is, it is, a, it is, so it is a seeker's perspective rather than Upanishads. Uh, sorry, Anand. So it is a seeker's perspective of the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, it is a yeah, yeah, it is see. a seeker's our own yogyata. Yeah, it is our own capacity as to how we see it. That what that is our problem. It is Vedas are always the same. They are they are all Gati Samanyat. Veda Vyasa has done that sutra, right? In the first hmm. Adhyaya, Samanvaya Adhyaya, Gati Samanyat. It says the same thing. Pragnesh. Sorry, just giving a very crude analogy, but it's like a, this uh, modern version of yoga, everybody is thinking yoga is a physical exercise. To be very honest, physical exercise is the lowest byproduct of yoga. Yoga is chitta vritti nirodha yoga. So controlling the mind and senses is yoga. And we all use it. I mean, in the modern world, it is portrayed to be a physical fitness activity. That's what it is. Uh, that's a very, very low. I mean, you are diluting. It's like a, this uh, even lower than is the Indian curry houses here. Now, you can't get the real sambar or in this in the curry houses here. You you have to make it yourself with the masalas yourself as well. Thank you. Very excellent, Pragnesh. Very well put. The, the yoga is not just stretching your arms and legs. There is a, a, a bigger meaning. Excellent. Prakash ji? I'm just, I'm just interested when you mentioned that the, uh, the uh, methods used in the Semitic religions is similar to us. Uh, next class, can you just for one or two minutes explain what they have done you know like similar to us uh, i'm just interested in knowing that it's very interesting to know that 
yeah okay. yeah yeah sure prakash i'll try and make an attempt about how that kabbalistic kabbala as it's called kabbalistic in the torah is very popular in in judaism where in the torah when they have a word and they will they'll take the letters out and move them here and there and understand etymologically what it means so they they do that in in judaism quite a lot i'll try and make an attempt I'm, i to be honest i don't know much about this i just know that they have this interpretation but i i lost i lost somebody who can help me with that uh, prakash thanks thank thank you jay thank you Okay, excellent. If there are no further questions, can I ask, uh, you know, let's take Anand to do us uh, Omkara today, please, and uh, we'll close today's session. Om. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, wonderful interactive session. So next week, I'm really looking forward to to look to look forward to discussing the Paravidya in 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 all its glory. And uh, we'll catch up next Sunday. Hare Krishna. Take care and stay safe. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Namaskar.